This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. They must have driven the same way, Ramon and his three little girls, south out of Sonoma along the serpentine highway leading toward the Petaluma dump. The hills on either side of the road rise and fall as they reach toward the horizon, and on that morning they would have been cloaked in gray slumber before the dawn. As her father drove, Carmina was aware of the occasional passing car, and every few minutes she'd ask him where they were going. He finally told me to shut up and sit down. She remembers. Now we were terrified. Something was very wrong. It seemed like we drove for a long time. Then I was aware that we had turned onto a dirt road, and then we stopped. Something had changed. The air seemed thick for some reason, and everything was silent. There were no sounds at all. We were just lambs being led to the slaughter. Outside the car, it was just about dawn, so the light was dull and gray. Inside, the shadows were darker. Everything was black and white, including her father's face as he turned toward them. I remember looking over at Sophia. She was holding baby Teresa, who was asleep. Then he called to me. Carmina, get up here. He didn't sound like Papa anymore. I don't know how to explain it, but it wasn't his voice. I was afraid, but I didn't know what else to do. I started to go up, but Sophia said no. She pushed me down on the floor behind his seat and motioned for me to stay there. Ramon demanded that Sophia hand him Teresa. But she wouldn't. Maybe she saw the knife. She held on tight, but he leaned over the seat and took the baby. She wasn't strong enough to hold on. Carmina grows quiet, sniffling every few seconds as the car turns onto the gravel road into the dump where the nightmare began. Detectives Brown and Ballinger arrived at our house on Baines Avenue and parked around the corner. They knew the street was only a block long, and they didn't want to take the chance that my father would spot them if he was there. Mike Brown was sure they were going to catch Ramon Celci, though. He just hoped it wasn't too late for whoever else might have been in the home. They had no idea what they were getting into. They couldn't even discuss a plan until they got close enough to see the house. They did know that the suspect was armed, that he had committed a murder and an attempted murder with cold-blooded efficiency, and that he'd already proved willing to look a man in the eyes and shoot him without warning or provocation. Slipping quickly through a neighbor's yard, they peeked around a corner. It didn't look good. There wasn't much cover between the street and the front of the house. Just a big open front yard. Near our front door, Detective Brown saw two small bicycles with training wheels. One of them tipped over onto its side. And a tiny tricycle. Kids in the house, he thought. That complicates things. Just as they were about to move, a woman came out of a neighboring house and asked what they were doing. Sheriff's Department, get back in your house, Brown demanded. When the woman retreated, the two detectives rushed forward, their forty-five caliber semi-automatic handguns held shoulder high, aimed at the house. As he advanced, Brown saw a bright red smear across the white front door. Blood. Reaching the house, Ballinger positioned himself to the side of the door. Brown crouched beneath the large picture window. He popped up to look in the window, then dropped out of sight. In that split second, he saw blood splatters inside the house, on the wall opposite the window. Ballinger pushed the door open slowly and took a quick look inside. Then, as Mike Brown covered him at the picture window, he went in the doorway and found himself in the living room with my parents' bed in it. A second later, Brown followed him inside, clearing the television room as Ballinger covered him from anyone suddenly appearing in the hall. Furniture was overturned. The television was on, and the screen was splattered with blood, as was the wall behind it. There were more blood spatters and smears on the walls in the hallway. And there, lying in a pool of thickening blood, was the body of a young woman. It was my mother, Angela Salcido. 
The two detectives quickly cleared the rest of the house, covering each other as they moved. 